Welcome to the sermon podcast for First St. Charles United Methodist Church in downtown St. Charles, Missouri. We are so glad that you're here, and it's our prayer that you feel safe, welcome, and wanted in this space. If you're interested in finding out more about us or supporting our ministries, you can connect with us online at firststcharlesumc.org. Today's scripture comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. In the reading of God's written word, we hear. In the hearing of God's word, we act. In the acting on God's word, it becomes living in our lives. Thanks be to God. My wife, Beth, who sees it as her one singular calling and mission in life to keep me humble, likes to say to me, you're not a very good pastor. You're just a lucky pastor. I'm certainly lucky to have a wife who's so dedicated to her vocation. And I'll gladly take the luck, wouldn't you? Since the beginning of time, in the murky mist that mixed religion and magic, persons have sought luck. See a penny? Pick it up. You're sure to have the best of luck. See a penny, let it lie. You're sure to want before you die. Knock on wood and tell me you haven't felt good at finding a four-leaf clover. Of course, depend on a rabbit's foot if you will. But remember, it didn't work out so well for the rabbit. And while we're trying to lead a charmed life, aren't there certain things to avoid step on a crack break your mother's back don't open an umbrella indoors don't cross paths with a black cat and if you break a mirror I don't want anything to do with you one day Jesus went up on a mountain sat down and said to his disciples bless you but not one single one of them had sneezed We really don't know whether or not saying bless you as a response to a sneeze has its origin in the desire to protect the sneezers from evil spirits or to fend off the demonic or as a remnant of an ancient recognition that sneezers aren't too long for this world, thus the need to commend their souls to God even as we wash our hands of them. What is certain is that the ancient origins of blessing were rooted in the desire for good, not evil. To have good luck, not bad. To be blessed, not cursed. In fact, the singularly oldest scripture we have, way older than the Dead Sea Scrolls and dating to the First Temple period, is from an amulet a lucky charm placed in a person's grave on which was inscribed the blessing that's also recorded in Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. The origins of blessing are rooted in our deep desire for good luck not bad what's even more certain 
is that when Jesus said to the disciples, bless you, they would have understood it in the context of a whole developed system of reward and punishment that commended certain behaviors and promised certain consequences. Today in our quest to learn to read the Bible again, we're looking at that particular type of literature found scattered throughout Scripture. The technical word is makarism, from the Greek makarios, from which we get that word that describes the action of blessing or the state of being blessed. The Bible contains many blessings or makarisms. God blessed Adam and Eve, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, says the proverb. The Apostle Paul gets in on the action saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And in Scripture's final book, seven blessings. Lucky number seven. Lucky are those who are so blessed. Of course, there are some biblical blessings that really ought to give us some pause. Psalm 137.9 comes to mind. Blessed is he who smashes your babies against the rocks. Killing the children of your enemies was a defensive move that ensured that the enemy children, enemy's children wouldn't grow up to kill your children. When people tell me that they're biblical Christians, I hope and pray they're not that kind of biblical Christian. There is a critical difference between being biblical and being Christ-like. The Apostle Paul provides the corrective. Bless those who persecute you, he says. Bless and do not curse them. As they developed in ancient religions and Judaism along with it, Macarisms were tied to a transactional deal with the divine. To do this will result in blessing. To not do that will result in curse. In its slicker showings, such theology of blessing shows up even today in the transactional view of the prosperity gospel preachers who say, if you just give to me and my cause, you'll be blessed by God. Translation, you'll get rich by making the preacher rich. Is that what you'd call a really lucky pastor? Or would you call them a shyster? I certainly would. Such a system of reward and punishment does work really well as long as things are going well. But when you do everything right and still things go wrong, this is what the Hebrew people ran into like a brick wall when they were carried away into Babylon. Suffering always, always calls into serious question any theology of blessing that's tied to believing right or doing right. In fact, the whole book of Job can be seen as a direct challenge to the macaristic theology that's little more than magic. When the righteous suffer, what does that say about blessing? On what is our theology of blessing based? Job demands 
to know. This is all the context for that day when a homeless dude whose choices will eventually find him dead at age 33 dared to challenge everything we know and believe about blessing. Earlier, we read from the New Revised Standard Version. Here's how the message translation puts it. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and His rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best meal you ever ate. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even into God's kingdom deeper. Not only that, count yourself blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And know that you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble talk about trouble everything we've always believed about being blessed is turned on its head notice there's not one single word that's tied to our believing the right things or doing the right things Jesus lifts up neither orthodoxy nor orthopraxy. It's not what we know or believe or do. It's who we are that matters in the kingdom and will result in our being blessed by Jesus. And as much as we might not want a level playing field, as much as we might want to privilege the rich, the young, the healthy, the good, looking, the successful, the tall, the smart, the hardworking. Jesus has a different idea about who will be blessed and can claim to be blessed by Him. One last thing. There will be some who want to translate macarisms as happy. I guarantee you that you'll find many Bibles with that exact translation. But there's nothing necessarily happy about the lives of those whom Jesus is wont to bless. His blessing is neither dependent on our happiness, nor does it guarantee it. But this is where we can find greatest comfort because no matter how we're feeling in the moment no matter the ups and downs of each day or even the trajectory of a whole life 
we can be claimed and blessed by God in Christ. Annie Dillard writes that the spiritual life begins the moment we make our lives empty and hollow like a cup. If we do, she says, grace comes like a person holding their hands like a cup under a waterfall. Empty your hands and your hearts of all that doesn't really matter and let your life be empty and hollow. Be like a cup under God's waterfall. It is this, this spiritual posture that from Christ's cupped hands pours forth the providence of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord.